Welcome to this online edition of the University of Toronto Where You Are series for alumni, which brings together some of the University of Toronto's most compelling thought leadership to you, wherever you are in the world, whether you're in the GTA, across Canada, or halfway around the world. Today's event is brought to you in partnership with our colleagues at the University of Toronto Mississauga and features Professor Andreas Park, who will be speaking about blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. This has proven to be an incredibly popular topic, which has attracted close to 10,000 registrants. Welcome to all who are joining us and a special welcome to those who might be joining us for the first time. My name is Barbara Dick, and I serve as Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations at the University of Toronto. I wish to take a moment to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and to work on this land. I know we're all looking forward to Professor Park's lecture and I'll turn things over to him in just a moment. But first, I'd like to give you a quick update about some of the things that are happening at the University of Toronto. As you can imagine, COVID-19 continues to be a core challenge, but the university is dedicated to planning a gradual return to campus this fall. I think you'll be pleased to know that your university was and continues to contribute in many critical ways to fighting the pandemic. Whether in the lab or on the front lines, our faculty members, researchers, students in healthcare disciplines, and our alumni have been part of the pandemic response. I hope that no matter where you are in the world, you're able to turn to the University of Toronto as a source of trusted information about COVID-19. In terms of broader global impact, U of T performed very well recently in QS World University rankings, which measure academic quality. Compared to other institutions worldwide, we were top 10 in seven areas, including education, anatomy and physiology, pharmacy and pharmacology, geography, and area studies. Another distinguishing factor is that we ranked in the top 50 across 46 subjects. No other university in the world placed so highly across so many disciplines. This speaks to the breadth of our excellence spanning the humanities and social sciences to medicine and engineering. If you're interested in more lectures like this and other content from the University of Toronto, please visit our virtual alumni hub at alumni.utoronto.ca. There you can find more information about other virtual offerings from across the university's three campuses. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Andreas Park. Andreas Park is a professor of finance at, in the Department of Management at Mississauga with a cross appointment to the Rotman School of Management. Professor Park teaches courses on fintech and financial market trading, and his current research focuses on the economic impact of technological transformations, such as blockchain technology. I'd also like to introduce the moderator for the Q&A session, which will follow Professor Park's lecture. Imri Gams is a U of T Mississauga alumnus who earned his honors BA in 2012 in history and English. Imri is a hedge fund manager, serial entrepreneur, and venture capitalist. He is currently the managing director of Parallax and is also a director and partner for Artemia LLC, an international asset management company. Imri has served as a volunteer since 2018 and currently serves on U of T Mississauga's campus council, the College of Electors, and he's a board director for U UTM's Alumni Association. Thank you for your loyalty and your outstanding leadership, Imri. And of course, thank you for joining us today. I will mention that Professor Park has agreed to record a follow-up session dedicated entirely to Q&A due to the overwhelming popularity of this event. 
and the significant number of questions we have already received. So please feel free to enter any additional questions in the live chat closer to the end of this presentation and keep an eye on your inbox for details about this follow-up session. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Professor Park. Thank you so much for the introduction, Barbara. Now I'm here to introduce you to blockchain, cryptocurrency and decentralized finance. Um, what the purpose of this presentation is, is to give you a primer. That's what the title said. So the idea is I give you very, very brief explanations of some of these major concepts here. I will talk to you about what a cryptocurrency is, what a blockchain is, and how it all can be used for a new area, uh, which is referred to as decentralized finance. In a nutshell, really what this is, is about building a new financial infrastructure for the 21st century that is open to all and can be used by all. I also want to do a bit of an outlook. I want to talk about some of the risks that are involved. Um, and then I want to talk about what other developments we see that also relate to this area. At the very end, I want to um, describe a little bit about the resources that we have here at, UTF, at UFT and what we have done in this area, what research is going on, teaching and so on and so forth, and how you might be able to contribute to this. So let's get right into it. Let me first talk about what a cryptocurrency is. Um, in my opinion, there is way too much attention being paid to Bitcoin these days, and it's very difficult to talk about cryptocurrency without talking about Bitcoin. Um, you know, the media in particular is mesmerized by the volatility of the price. You know, it went up from 8,000 last year to about 60,000 earlier this year in US dollars and now back to what, 35,000. Now, obviously, this is very fascinating, but it is uh, a bit of a distraction because, you know, cryptocurrencies and blockchain are about a lot more. And in some sense, even though I'm giving you a primer here, um, it's sometimes a bit difficult to understand really what it is. What is, however, relatively easy to understand is how it can be used. Now, um, the first thing I should say is uh, in 2017, Jamie Dimon, um, CEO of JP Morgan, one of the biggest in the, uh, banks in the world, came out and said that Bitcoin is a fraud and that he would fire anybody who would be trading Bitcoin in his firm because they would be stupid. Now, um, Bitcoin at its core is code, right? It's not a thing. Um, I like to liken it to uh, digital stickers, but at the core, it's just a piece of code that uh, an, a large group of people have agreed to use in a particular way. So how could this be a fraud? Right? That, that makes no sense by itself. It's also not a Ponzi scheme, as uh, Nicholas Taleb said, who wrote The Black Swan. It, it is just a piece of code. Now, um, but the, the core fee, fee, uh, feature of Bitcoin is it essentially it's you have digital items um, that you can exchange. And the Bitcoin network is effectively only doing this one thing, or as I like to call it, it's a one-trick pony. But if you think about it a little, more, a little harder, what we really see in this network is that a group of people agrees to deploy a particular code and that they agree when that code has run. And that at its core was the idea that Vitalik Buterin said, had when he, when he looked at this more carefully and said, well, can we not, instead of running this particular piece of code, can we not uh, build a network around the idea that we can run any piece of code? Um, and, and that basically gave rise to the Ethereum network. Now in the Ethereum network, essentially, it's a network of computers. Uh, so it's not one, but it's a distribution of computers. And effectively, it's like a big database. Um, where changes to the database in, in some form of code, and the database is very general in the sense of, a, you know, it could be pieces of code that could be run, um, where the entire network agrees um, on changes on code. Now, so the idea is, is that, um, you know, somebody deploys, makes a request to run a piece of code, and then all the computers in this network run the same piece of code, so that the, the, the state of the network itself is changed according to, uh, you know, this particular piece of code. Now, what is the problem with that? When you run a piece of code and you ask a large network of computers to run a piece of code, you can easily write a piece of code which would basically run uh, infinite, infinitely long, right? And would never stop. And if you do that, you could crash that code, right? So now, um, how, do you, how do you get around that problem? Well. The person who wants to ask to have the piece of code run, you make them pay for it. So every time they want to have a piece of code run, they give a particular amount of money and that amount of money pays for the running of computational cycles. And when that money is exhausted, 
the code stops running. And that in its effect is what a cryptocurrency is. It's the means of payment that you have in order to run these pieces of code. So it's an internal accounting mechanism and it is actually essential to the operation of the network. But here's the economic functionality that is critical to it. The cryptocurrency is something that you use to get a utility, right? So to get a service. So, and this is slightly why, for instance, the cryptocurrency Ether is different from uh, Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, I mean, you get the one service, which is the transfer of a piece of Bitcoin. In Ethereum, you use this item to pay for the service, which is the computation. Uh, and people are willing to pay quite a bit. So um, about seven and a half million dollars each day is paid in fees in the Ethereum network. So that's about a healthy two and a half billion dollars a year that is accumulates in fees. And it gives you maybe some idea of why this network as a whole actually can legitimately have money if people legitimately want a piece of code to run on the network. All right. Now this is, I, I understand this is very abstract, um, but now let me crank it up just a notch more, which is, uh, let me explain to you what a blockchain is. Now, the uh, initial invention of Bitcoin by um, Satoshi Nakamoto was effectively him putting together two existing pieces of technology. Um, and uh, the two pieces of technology were uh, basically the idea of a blockchain, which is used in timestamp servers, and the proof of work protocol. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the proof of work protocol, but I'm going to explain to you why this is useful and why it's actually uh, important to have. Um, it was Bitcoin, by the way, was not the first uh, attempt at uh, doing electronic cash, but the problem with most electronic cash is that they couldn't solve the double spend problem, and Bitcoin has solved that. So now, what am I talking about here? Effectively, as I said, a blockchain is just a big database. Uh, there's transactions or running of pieces of code that happen. So all of these transactions are bundled together. This is the convention um, and processed in blocks, in pieces of code. Now a block has a header and a footer. And I hope the ones that are experts on this bear with me for a second. Of, you know, it's, it's not entirely accurate, but it gets you, gets you to the idea. Um, but it has a header and a footer. Um, and now when you have a new block, the trick about the header and the footer is as follows. Think of the, uh, the footer as a digest of all the information in the block. Essentially, it takes all the data that's there and puts it into a particular 64-bit uh, piece of information. It's called a hash. And this, uh, this way to generate this, uh, this uh, hash or this, this um, digest is unique. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a function. And so then what you do is when you put the, build the header of the new block, you add the footer, footer of the preceding block so that each block links to the block before. Now, why is this useful? Well, if you wanted to make a change, for instance, sometime in the past by manipulating a record, what would happen is that the digest is no longer accurate. And then the network would notice that the digest of this change block is not the same as what was referenced in the block that follows it in the header. And therefore, the network would reject this manipulation. And so you can't do that. Now, that makes the blockchain, that makes actually the past uh, unchangeable and it makes it suitable as a vehicle to look at value transfers. But there is a little more to it. Now, now imagine you have a transaction here in this blockchain in the second block from the left. Right? And so this is, for instance, Alice gives Bob money and Bob in return gives Alice a car. Now the car transfer happens in the real world. Now, as I already said, Alice cannot revoke this transaction on this blockchain because that would be rejected by the network. But what Alice could do is she could build a new blockchain which eliminates or, or ignores the particular block and which creates essentially an alternative reality of new blocks. Now, how would she do this? Well, she would have to have the ability to build a large number of blocks, which basically um, are, um, you know, as a longer chain than the existing chain. And there's a convention that you usually add a new block to the existing longest chain. And I'm not going to go into the details there. Now, how could she do this, though? Well, she needs to be able to predictably create these blocks in a row. And here's how the competitiveness and if you want the economics of blockchain come into place. So, here, what happens is, is that many entities want to compete to build these blocks. Why? Well, because they get paid for doing so. So now what you need, therefore, is you need a mechanism that determines at random who will be the next entity that gets to form a block. 
Um, because if you do have the, a random mechanism, then here Alice, for instance, would not know, would not have the certainty that she needs in order to create a series of blocks. And that's essentially what the proof of work protocol does. It is a mechanism which helps you to select among a very large group of entities that want to contribute and build the blockchain, one at random that creates a new block. This is not the only mechanism that exists, but this is the key idea behind it. So if you put these two items together, you can solve the double spending problem and you can build an internet of value where you can have value transfers. And of course, where you can have the decentralized execution of code, which is essential for what's coming next. Now I gotta be honest, um, understanding Bitcoin and, and blockchain is actually not straightforward. Um, and it is, as you hopefully may have seen now, it's not that straightforward to explain because it is a rather uh, abstract concept. Um, but the application is not. The application is actually really exciting because what it is at its core is it, uh, it allows value transfers, right? decentralized value transfers without the involvement of a trusted third party. And therefore, the direct application of such a thing would be the area of finance. And what we've seen over the last uh, year or so unfold is the coming life of a large number of projects which have the capacity to fundamentally transform the way how finance works in our modern world. So let me give you this a little bit of an ex explanation here. So what is decentralized finance? It is the provision of financial services without the necessary involvement of a traditional financial intermediary. So in other words, you provide finance such as it is, the same level of, of access to credit and loans and so on, but without involving a bank or a broker. Now, why is this important? Well, here's a little graph that shows you uh, the prices for financial services for the last, what, 20 years or so. Um, and you, as you can see, this is for France, Germany and the US, it's data from the BIS. Um, the prices for financial services have gone up. Right um, in France, that were at least they have stayed constant. In France, they stayed constant. In the U.S., they went up by about thirty percent. Okay, and so then if you think about finance and you see, well, finance has transformed since then, right? So much of what finance did became digital or became electronic. So computer technology was a major contributing factor to you know the transformation and to uh, to what finance has been doing. And if you look at the f cost of IT services they have doubt, gone down quite dramatically in the US by about 90%, in France and Germany by something like 30 to 40%. So in other words, one of the major inputs into a technology has gone down and yet the price of what came out, the service itself has gone up. Um, that is for an economist a little concerning um, and you have to ask yourself the question of how this is possible. Now here's my take on this one. I believe that the fundamental problem with the financial industry is its infrastructure because it is effectively siloed. Here, for instance, you have the payments network, you have a network which, con which stores bonds, stocks, options, you have swaps, another network which, which deals with swaps, credit default swaps, mortgage backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and you have insurance contracts. All of them run on different networks. And to link them, you need the financial institutions. Now, why is this problematic? Well, it makes it problematic because financial institutions become gatekeepers. And the role of a gatekeeper can be a useful one, but it can also lead to what's referred to as rent extraction. When you get money, not for what you do, but for what you, what you are. When that happens, you create economic losses in an economy. And I think we're pretty close to that, the case. I, I'd be very happy to discuss that in more detail, uh, especially for the case of Canada. Now, what is a, what is a blockchain? What is essential finance? Well, in practice, what the idea of the provision of financial services without intermediaries is boils down to is that you create a new financial infrastructure that is a common resource that anybody can operate on. And when I say anybody, it's not just financial institutions, but anybody who has an idea to bring some, you know, bring people together to provide a central service or product can use this resource to deliver it. This has been uh, an area of enormous growth, growth. You can see in this graph here, it's essentially exponential growth. Um, I used this graph or version of this graph in October when I taught my class and you can see, you know, the increase that was there from essentially zero to what, 12 million at the time, $12 billion at a time. 
it went almost up all the way to 90 billion over a very, very short stretch of time. So there's tremendous growth in this area. And this is actually what I think also me the media should be spending more time on. Now, let me give you a few examples to just illustrate to you why this idea of a common resource is useful. And the first thing I should talk about is decentralized trading, because a lot of what the decentralized finance world is about is you transfer values of, it uh, of value. Transferring values of item, uh, values, so items of value involves some form of trading. Right? Now, one of the most ironic things about the blockchain world in its early days was that even though these cryptocurrencies lived on decentralized network and you know, the whole ethos of this area was all about decentralization, uh, the trading of these uh, digital items still occurred on centralized exchanges, like you know, somebody having a, uh, a laptop or, or a server somewhere. And so and nothing of that happened on the decentralized network. And that leads to fraud, hacks, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we had our own little uh, example here in, in, in Canada with Quadriga X, um, but that's just, you know. So this is really just a, uh, not the way how blockchain intends to be. But organizing decentralized trading is not easy. Now, conceptually, it's not that hard because, you know, ultimately a, a limit order, right, uh, which is a price order to say, I want to sell 100 shares of RBC for a particular price is just a smart contract. It's a piece of code that I can deploy on the blockchain. And the first implementation of decentralized trading were exactly that. So you basically would submit a smart contract, which is an order, you send it to the blockchain, and then anybody could trade against it. And there were then websites that would collect that information to build order books. But that's not a very efficient way to do it. And it's actually pretty expensive, you know, because you have to, every time you put in an order, you actually have to pay for it. So that's not the way it should be done. And it's also not very innovative. But then some people came up with the idea and said, hey, why don't we actually use some features of a blockchain, which is that you can build a contract, which is essentially a vault or a collection of uh, a pooling contract where people can pool resources and do something. And so the idea over there was you build a contract where willing liquidity providers deposit funds so that other people can trade against it. Now, the interesting part about this is you deposit it into this contract so that you be, get a pool of liquidity. And as somebody who has contributed to that pool, you can retain the exposure to the asset that you want. But for providing liquidity, you actually receive a fee. Right? So in other words, you actually make your capital work. So the way this works is you pool the resources, somebody can send money to this contract and then in return receives an item from this contract. All of this would happen instantaneously. That means somebody wants to make their trade. This is a so-called atomic swap, where on the blockchain, this contract initiates an exchange of DAI, so one item to another item, which happens directly. No two-day delay and so on and so forth. It is a phenomenal idea and it works extremely quickly. Now, as you can see here, the, the growth in the volume that is processed by these decentralized trading since they've gone live uh, sometime in the middle of last year has been phenomenal. Nowadays, these contracts uh, collectively process more trades than, for instance, Coinbase, which is at IPO was valued at $80 billion. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, so this is, <clears throat> this is a phenomenal increase. And the, the really cool part about this is this core contract is about only 200 lines of code. So if you want to, you can say that 200 lines of code functionally replace the function of an 80 to 100 billion dollar company. Now, next thing is decentralized lending works in a similar principle. You take your, uh, to take an asset of value. Um, for instance, it could be, you know, cryptocurrency like Ether, but it could also be a non-fungible token, which is a representation of a painting. Um, and in the future, you can use anything that can be tokenized, so where you can store a token on the blockchain can be used as collateral. And then the collateral locks, these, uh, locks this up and in, in return provides you with funds um, that you can use in order to, you know, here this is a digital representation of the US dollar, it's called DAI, and you can use this for purchases or for other investments if you want. Um, and so these applications are out there and they're already working. Now, this is often linked to or described as DeFi Legos, meaning that there is a large number of applications that you can combine together in order to create a product for yourself, in order to create an investment portfolio for yourself, or just to use it simply 
uh, you know, to, to make purchases um, with the digital representation of items. Um, now, let me explain to you also how these interact. And, and one of the coolest features of that is, uh, of this, in this world is what's referred to as a flash loan. And what a flash loan is essentially is you borrow something and you repay it essentially at the end of a string of transactions that happen all at the same time. And so this loan at itself is an entirely risk-free loan. But it is crucial for the operation of the system because effectively it ensures that there's the forces of arbitrage are at, at work so that you know markets work efficiently. So let me give you this as an example. Imagine you have uh, put made a collateralized loan in a system called Compound and the borrowing rate that you currently pay for that is 15%. Right? And so um, you know for this example which I took from uh, Cam Harvey's upcoming book um, is you deposited $150 uh, um, ether worth, ethers, which are worth, let's say, 10,000 DAI, which is the digital representation of a dollar. Okay? So now, but you observe that on AVE, which is another system, you can actually borrow at 5%. So what do you do? Well, you initiate a flash loan. So you go to AVE and say, I want to have a $10,000 flash loan. Then you take these 10,000 DAI and you uh, repay it for your compound loan. Then you go to the compound contract that you have and you reclaim your collateral then in the fourth step you take your collateral and you uh, form a collateral and now you deposit it into an AVE contract then you take 10,000 DAI from that contract right so that the ones that you received in return for your collateral and you use that to repay your flash loan and the, th the way this works is this is all a string of transactions which are submitted simultaneously and if any of these different steps would fail then automatically the entire, the, uh, all of these transactions would fail and therefore the loan never comes into being. And so this makes the loan effectively risk-free. Now this is a very simple example. You can have these loans and these, these uh, strings of transactions. They can span 150 different types of transactions. Um, but what this really means fundamentally is that this, because all of these items and because all of these contracts work on the same infrastructure, the forces of arbitrage are really strong and so therefore as a market this is by far more efficient. And again the, the contracts that are involved in the codes that are run they're relatively short, right? just a few dozen lines of code to make this work. So this is a phenomenal development in the world of finance. Now I shouldn't be, I mean obviously this is something that I'm very excited about but I think there is, it's also important to emphasize that there are some risks and that there's open problems. Um, I'm just going to go briefly over this. Many of these apps are still very experimental. So some of the uh, problems in which the way they function, we still find out now. Uh, there are kinks that need to be ironed out and there's, you know, a phenomenal amount of redevelopment over and over again. Um, there's also some, some real progress in the underlying technology needed, for instance, the way the blockchains work. Um, the Ethereum network, for instance, still runs on a, uh, on a proof of work protocol, which we know is energy inefficient. Now they're already running a parallel chain which is based on proof of stake which would essentially eliminate 90%, 99% of the energy usage of the blockchain and they will be merging them by the end of the year. Um, but, it, but there are still uh, steps that are necessary in order to improve uh, the scaling of these blockchains because they can't process very much um, at this point in time. I'm going to talk about some of the work a colleague of mine has been, is doing uh, on this a little later. Um, so there are still some problems that need to be um, ironed out before this is really ready for the big stage if you want. More importantly though, even with all of the tech problems out of the way, there are some fundamental problems that change the way how we think about risk in this world. Now usually we have accountants for instance and auditors that look at firms to make sure that funds are being used properly and so they basically are able to look under the hood. You know, when you have these smart contracts, they are out in the open because everything is open source, right? But there is a separate set of problems that could arise. So for instance, there could be a code, a smart contract could be deployed um, and the code is not written well. So that happened, for instance, in the very first iteration of a, of a blockchain with a DAO, um, just after year after Ethereum launched, where um, you know, two lines of code in a major contract were in the wrong order and that allowed somebody to essentially uh, extract 30% of the entire amount that was deposited in this contract. You need to get rid of that, of course. Uh, now there's firms that actually already provide the service. Here in Toronto is one called Quantstamp and, and they're working on this. 
Um, but it's really important to understand that once you have written a contract, it is out there and it can be used, right? It's, it's you know, it, everybody has access to it and if it runs the wrong way, it's very difficult to, to get it to, 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 what is it called, to bring the horses back into the barn. Um, next thing is, uh, even when you have written the contract and even if the code has no problems or no vulnerabilities, it's still not clear that the economic incentives that it tries to provide actually work the way how you intend them to work. Right? So you actually need to think this through very hard and that requires business people to think about and economists to think about these problems and to actually understand what the environment is and how they would be used. There's also, you know, when you write a contract, you may have to think about unforese foreseeing the unforeseen contract contingencies that are important for you and you could have contagion risks. Right? So when one contract gets liquidated, another contract may have to get liquidated and so on and so forth. But differently, for instance, to like the uh, L2CM crisis in 1999, um, where basically one hedge fund almost blew up all of Wall Street uh, through a possible snowball effect. In this world, it's transparent what happens. So what you need is just to do proper data analytics of the existing contracts and how they work. So it requires a different type of thinking um, and it requires using information that's out there in the open. Another problem that needs to be solved, and this is coming speaking from an uh, from the economics perspective, is there's, you know, we will build institutions that run on these blockchains and they run therefore based on code, but they still have to make decisions. So they still have to be governed in some way. So how do you govern, govern them correctly? Um, how do you govern these decentralized organizations? Uh, how do you write the code in such a way that you actually have a working decision-making process. We know how to do this with boards and people, or we have at least an idea about it, but doing this with the code is actually a completely different problem. And of course, there's the role of regulators, right? So now one of the things is these are not banks, these are not institutions, there's not a firm that you can go to and knock on the door and say, hey, you have to do X, Y, Z, right? That's not the way it works. You can write a code, any kid in the world can write a code and deploy it. So you can't go necessarily, first of all, the kid may not be in your jurisdiction. Second, you may not know who the kid is that actually deployed the code. And third, the code is going to be out there. As long as the blockchain lives, that code continues to exist. So how do you handle this as a regulator? I think it requires a rethink. It also requires a rethink, I think, for law enforcement because you know, law enforcement made financial institutions essentially a, a deputy for their money laundering or for the, pre uh, for the prevention of crime. Now, this is an open network where this is not possible. So on the other hand, of course, law enforcement has a much higher degree of uh, transparency. So I think they have to rethink the form of how they do their law enforcement of money laundering or of prevention of crime. Um, and as I said, and then so of course, then the regulators have to uh, acquire a completely new set of skills because effectively they need to understand how these smart contracts work if they want to, want to do anything about it. Uh, but these change at a very rapid pace. Uniswap version 2 is different from Uniswap version 3 and so you need to wrap your head around that. So that's a really hard problem. Now what lies ahead? What other developments are there? Um, clearly let me go first of all show you this picture here because I think this is quite telling. These are you know I think they're about the 20 uh, countries with the largest uh, inflation in the world. You have Venezuela with about 10,000% uh, inflation a year, but then you have Argentina with 47%, Iran with 22%, and so on and so forth. And I think you can make a case to say these countries have uh, you know, money that is probably worth less than the paper that it's printed on. Right? And, and it's very painful when you live in these high, uh, high inflation countries. However, what these countries also have is they have a reasonably high degree of smartphone penetration, meaning that people have the ability to use their smartphone. And what that means is that when they have um, you know, a smartphone, then they can access the internet and then with that they can access the blockchain network. So in other words, these you know, people in these countries, this is data from 2018, this is collectively an amount of uh, about 850 million cell phones that exist or smartphones that exist. So these are all possible users of a blockchain network and they will therefore all have access to digital representation of a US dollar they will have access to financial services. What that could lead to is to a worldwide increase in access to financial services, which we know is a major contributor to the betterment and to the development uh, of people, generally speaking. So this is a huge opportunity. Um, now, um, of course, you know, I'm not the, you know, people in the blockchain world are not the only people who have thought about this. 
Facebook has thought about this too. They saw the opportunity that blockchain technology could lead to the development of a new financial infrastructure. And frankly, for many of the tech firms, our current payments network simply doesn't work. It's too clunky, too slow, and way too expensive. So, um, you know, Facebook therefore went out and built the Libra Now DM Association, uh, which is, includes, for instance, Shopify. And they went out and said, we're going to build a new financial infrastructure. And their particular use case and what they put on their website is precisely the remittance market where they could help people in developing countries to uh, improve their financial well-being. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, Facebook is not so much uh, something which relates to the US or Canada or the UK. It actually has a huge worldwide audience of over 2 billion people in India, in Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, all of these countries and people in this country would probably welcome the idea of having access to a digital representation of the dollar, the euro, sterling, and so on and so forth. And that will fundamentally change the way how people use money in these countries. And of course, let's not forget, Facebook will also bring a lot of functionality with it. So it's not like they're building an infrastructure and they just say, well, you can exchange these US dollars, that's it. There's going to be tools for online commerce and so on and so forth available. And there's also going to be a link to the blockchain world. Now, Central banks and governments, of course, notice this too. And this is a graph which shows you just the extent to which uh, central banks have been undergoing research projects to use digital currencies and to, uh, you know, think about ways how they can be part of this transformation too. The biggest uh, one is, of course, China, which has uh, the digital yuan or the DCEP and is already in a pilot phase and it will most likely get live very soon. Now, they've been working on this for, what, eight years or so. Uh, so, um, you know, they are set, a <clears throat> set ahead of many of the developing countries. But even for the smaller countries that are, uh, in particular for smaller countries that want to maintain some form of monetary policy, once people have access in this global world to, you know, the stable currencies like the dollar or the euro and the like, or even the yuan, they will most likely have a tendency to use it. First out of convenience and eventually out of necessity. So this is a threat to the monetary sovereignty of these small countries. But it's coming and uh, it's coming also to Canada. Canada has, well hopefully, Canada has a, the Bank of Canada has issued a contingency plan. Although I have to say if the contingency are met it's probably too late. So um, I hope we're going to go get on with this very soon. And uh, so this is something that's definitely coming over the next few years. Now lastly, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening at U of T. And this is of course from a very, very selfish perspective. So we're already offering courses on blockchain, decentralized finance in the commerce program, the MBA program, um, at uh, the uh, Faculty of Applied Sciences in the ECE department. Um, and, you know, this is just the ones I know of. I'm sure there's other departments that also offer them. Um, we have uh, an, a research institute it's called Ledger Hub. It's uh, been sponsored by Conrad Grant. I am one of the co-founders. The other one is Andreas Veneris from ECE. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is, this is where we started, kickstarted our activities. We have the FinHub at uh, Rotman, which is a large part is about AI and machine learning, which is really important for the legacy financial institutions, but also has a blockchain focus, which, which I represent mostly. <clears throat> um, there's a few people and research groups where people are working on this. We have my aforementioned colleague, Andreas Veneris from ECE, who worked on decentralized oracles, so that's the idea of bringing information from out of the blockchain into the blockchain. He works on CBDCs and he is, you know, just a great collaborator general. Um, there's my own work. I work on decentralized trading, CBDCs and financial infrastructure. And then, um, you know, I have my colleague at uh, the computer science department, Fan Long, who is, he has some really genius inventions. He um, found a way, together with, his, uh, with, with Andrew Yao, Turing Award winner from MIT, they found a way how you can process blocks, not in a serial way, as I showed you in my picture, but in a parallel way. And as you know from parallel computing, parallel computing is extremely powerful to get capacity and speed up computing. And what that does is basically they create a blockchain which has enormously higher capacity compared to, uh, you know, the Ethereum network. So it's orders of magnitude far, um, higher and faster. And they also have a clever economic model which allows them to, you know, basically tax people for the usage of space, which is another problem that Ethereum faces. So check out what he does. This is now led to a, uh, the, the foundation of another blockchain network which is called Conflux. Um, and, and he's doing some really amazing work there. Now I should say that um, since I'm talking to the alumni, um, I want to say this. Um, 
The Walton School in the US has received a uh, $30 million grant two years back or so to study fintech and uh, you know, with particular blockchain and so on. And as far as I remember, they had actually nobody even working on this at the time. So they got $30 million. Uh, the Ledger Hub has a funding of $250,000, which is running out. Um, and so if you're interested in sponsoring some of this research and want to get involved with this, we're very happy to have a conversation about that. And now with that, I'm going to end my presentation. If you want to have any information about me, you can find me on Twitter. You can, here's my email address. All the slides that I use will be put on, uh, an, in, on an online system called slides.com where you can find them. And of course, all my videos, including all my teaching videos from the last uh, you know, COVID-related uh, fall are on my YouTube channel. This is not a monetized channel, so you know, there should be no ads for it. And uh, there's also my website. Please feel, feel free to get in touch. And now I'm looking forward to jumping into the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park, for that informative presentation and for introducing our audience to the complex and sometimes confusing world of decentralized finance. I'm really excited to be here today to moderate this Q&A, as this is an area of great interest to me on both the personal and professional levels. Now, as Barbara mentioned earlier, we received over a thousand questions from registrants. So in addition to today's webinar, we'll be recording a follow-up session with Professor Park dedicated solely to answering questions that have been submitted from registrants and today's audience. So please feel free to enter any additional questions into the live chat and I'll get started with our first question. What is mining and what are its environmental impacts? Is this going to become an environmental disaster? Regardless of green energy or not, will this technology always require a massive amount of electricity? Thanks, Imran. This is a, a very good question. It actually goes at the core of some of the operations of blockchain technology. So um, there is several things that can be said about this. Number one, the way Bitcoin is organized, it requires the proof of work. And the proof of work requires you to do random guesses um, in order to find a solution to a cryptographic puzzle so that you are have that you win the ability to form a new block that will always be run as a, as it is on uh, using computer computer software and computer tools and use uh, a lot of computations and so that requires energy and therefore that requires um, you know electricity so in for Bitcoin mining this is something which is almost inevitable and it's actually baked into the code. However, um, as I said, you know, at the beginning of my talk, I am not a fan of Bitcoin. I think this is actually not where the future is moving. I think the future is moving towards blockchains such as Ethereum, which do decentralized computation so that you can run finance applications and also, you know, decentralized digital identities and so on and so forth. Now, the Ethereum network was very explicit from its get-go that they wanted to move to a proof-of-stake system, which does not require this energy usage. Uh, it took them much longer than they thought because there are actually a lot of open questions on that one, but they're moving that way. Hopefully, by the end of the year, they're there. And at that point, the energy usage goes down from by about 99.9%. Um, so it still you know, requires energy because it's a computer system, right? Every computer system requires energy, but it's going to be not the same as a state or a country, but more like a small village. Thank you. Uh, now our second question, are cryptocurrencies going to undergo regulation? Is that even possible? And how are countries and central banks uh, reacting to cryptocurrency? So this, this is a very deep question and um, it's very difficult to answer that very quickly. Again, I tried to allude to it a little bit. Um, it starts, begins and ends with the fact of what is it that you want to regulate. Um, we've seen recently that the OSC um, cracked down on, on the crypto exchanges and asked them that they have to get under regulation. And there's a good reason for that, because many crypto exchanges, these centralized exchanges take custody of people's assets. That makes them you know, something which is much closer to a broker than actually an exchange or anything else. And for that reason, when, when you take custody of consumers' assets, of, of investors' assets, you have a lot of obligations, rightfully so. However, if you look at the genuine decentralized world, we're looking at a completely different problem, right? So for instance, take Uniswap. Um, I described this in some detail in the presentation as a decentralized exchange. Uniswap is a piece of code that runs on the blockchain. As long as the blockchain exists, that piece of code is there. So what are you gonna regulate about that? You're gonna you know, talk, you know, it's essentially it's like yelling at a cloud, 
right? So there's nothing you can do about it. Once a piece of code is out there, that's it. And you don't know who deployed the code, even though there's an owner of a smart contract, it doesn't mean that you know the person who was behind that. And it's not even clear what it is that you, what, what the role of a regulator here is actually, right? Because the contract does what it says, everything is open source, right? So there's nothing, is, there's nobody is being misled. A lot of regulation, the origin of a lot of regulation is that there are usually some conflicts of interest and that there are gaps in information between different parties. So when you have a broker, your broker has custody of your assets, he may use your assets in some form for borrowing and lending, and there should be a mechanism in place to make sure that there is no abuse of the power of it. Um, a broker gives you information. There's uh, differences in information levels, and it's not always clear what the broker gives you as information and if this is in your interest. And we have a regulation around that. But not everything needs to be regulated. So the role of the regulator in the centralized world is, is actually unclear, and there has to be some thinking about what a role could be. So let me leave it at that. But this is, an in, this is almost a, a topic of an entire several hours worth of discussion. Yes, I, you know, I, I agree entirely. And uh, given, my, given my personal work experience in the, in the finance industry, specifically with asset management and, 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 um, and active trading, you know, what I've come to understand is that regula regulation is an important step in the maturation of a market. And from what I've seen personally, is that when a market is running hot, the appetite for regulation is fairly low. Usually the appetite for regulation increases uh, once there's an adverse uh, event or, or, a, or a shock or, or a catalyst or any other number of terms you could, you know, you could use. And then once that occurs and, and retail investors are, are burnt or hurt, um, that, that's when we've historically seen, uh, a sh I'd say sharper calls for regulation. And some of that is, is politicized and, and you could argue to, to a point that some of that is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction initially, um, but I think it's all part of the process of a market maturing and, and giving participants uh, the ability to express themselves, express a view, uh, and, and based on what happens afterwards, you know, the, the needs and the steps for regulation will become increasingly more clear. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of work and, and, and likely a lot of time that has to pass before the answers to these kinds of questions become crystallized. Um, but, but I agree, this is a whole, whole rabbit hole in, a, in and of itself and can lead to, to several hours of, of good discussion. Now, let me say one thing though, I think this actually fits in nicely here. So a few weeks ago, we had a massive drop in cryptocurrencies from one day to the next of something on the order of an entire market dropping by about 40%. Now imagine the same thing would have happened in stock markets, right? I mean, we would essentially see the Federal Reserve step in. We would see, you know, people, you know, screaming out on the street. First, certainly Kramer on his, on his show would be throwing stuff against the wall. Um, you know, we would talk about bailouts and of mutualization of the losses. The crypto world, not so much. And, you know, essentially it was something like half a trillion dollars was wiped off uh, with, within a few hours. And what happened? Well, you know, the, the people who owned the tokens basically had to absorb the losses as they should in a normal market. There was no mutualization of it. So in some sense, the market actually worked extremely well as it's supposed to. We can argue whether or not there was manipulation before that. That's a, that's a bigger question. I think um, this is some, one of the questions that we're going to answer in the longer Q&A that we're going to record separately. I think there's actually some really good developments in this space. I, I love that you said that. Um, and I, I, I love when, when we discuss markets like like stocks uh, in relation to cryptocurrency because I, I think this leads fan, it, it leads in really well with this next question um, and you know when, when we think of, of a stock like Shopify or, or Apple you know we, we think of this large corporate entity that employs people you know they, they manufacture products or sell goods and services and and therefore it's possible uh, for, for someone to, to come up with some kind of fundamental valuation of that company. And, and so this next question seems pretty relevant and apropos, what is the value of any given coin based upon? What are the demand and supply dynamics that influence prices? Do you think there are any way that the values will eventually stabilize and become less volatile? Okay, let, let me do let me two, two examples for this one. And, and so also you can see the difference here. So if, start with Bitcoin, right? 
What is Bitcoin? Well, as I said, it's, it's the trading, it's digital stickers, right? They have no intrinsic value. The value that they have is only what people attribute to it. And you know what? That actually sounds pretty much like gold to me, right? I mean, gold has, a, has value somehow. You can trade on markets. Okay, you know, people like the shiny stuff. So there's a marginally higher value of gold. But in principle, you can't use gold for anything reasonable these days, right? Um, my former macro prof, Willem Boiter, referred to it as the 6,000-year bubble. Right. And I think you can make that case. And Bitcoin is pretty close to that. It has value because people attribute value to it. And that's extremely dissatisfying for an economist. But now let me move to Ethereum. Um, and let's consider that token or that asset or whatever you want to call it. Now, I mentioned that earlier that Ethereum will move to a proof of stake system. So what you do under that system is you take your Ethereum, you put it into a contract, and then uh, you have the ability to use these particular stakes based on the stakes that you have. You can you get the ability to form blocks. And that means that the stakes and the value that you have in Ethereum gives rise to your ability to form blocks, will really give rise to your ability to collect fees based on that. So in other words, the, the token itself is a source of income in the future. Now, if you look at the current Ethereum blockchain, um, which creates about $7 million worth of fees per day, it's not clear what the, what the fees people would be willing to pay for in the future is, but, but you can see that there will be a cash flow that is coming towards these tokens in the future. And that allows you to actually describe it. Now, the fundamental reason though here is, is that Ethereum provides you with utility. And once you provide a utility, you can try to price it. So what I'm trying to say here, generally speaking, is just because Bitcoin is weird and Dogecoin is worse, it doesn't mean that everything in the crypto world happens out of thin air. There's real utilities provided, and that provides a way to find a valuation. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a that's a fantastic perspective. It, it it's one it's one I happen to agree with as as well. I, I always struggle with with the concept of supply and demand when it comes to financial markets. And this is something, you know, this is, this is a subject matter that I find fascinating, but I, I think there is a distinction between what I would call an economic market. For example, the market for milk and eggs versus a financial market, um, like, like the stock market for, for, for instance. And I, I believe that at certain times, um, a, a market can operate as more of an economic market. And then at other times it will operate more as a financial market. The difference to me being that a financial market is irrational and is driven by speculators. Whereas an economic market is driven by uh, price equilibrium between consumers and producers. And what, what I find interesting as a trader uh, and investor is that right now the cryptocurrency market has all of the characteristics of a financial market, um, meaning that it is highly emotional. And there, the, the correlation between demand and prices in a financial market tend to trend in the same direction, meaning that as prices go higher, demand actually also tends to rise as well. The inverse tends to be true for more economic markets. So for example, if the price of eggs went up by 2000%, uh, people would simply stop buying eggs uh, until the price stabilized to a point where they can justify buying eggs at, at, at that price. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting because we, we can't apply that same common sense rational uh, decision-making process to something like like Bitcoin or, or Dogecoin or, or Ethereum. I, I, would, I would argue any cryptocurrency at this time is very difficult for the average person to, to make a rational decision around. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think the discussion around supply-demand dynamics will continue to be exceptionally fascinating um, for, for speculators, analysts, market participants, um, and you know anyone involved in this industry in one way or another, uh, I, I'm really interested to see how this uh, how this space is going to evolve over the short term and, and the long term as well. Well, if I if I may just add a little bit as uh, speak as the finance professor speaking, so um, it is not a <clears throat> a lot of fi what we do in finance is relative pricing of assets, right? Um, so you know we're really good at catch up economics as as in some sense, right? Means that. We're really good at making sure that if you buy a two liter bottle of ketchup, it costs the same as two one liter bottles of ketchup, so to speak. But understanding the value of ketchup is a little harder to do. Now we have models for that too, but that's, as I said, it's harder to do, right? And um, for, for firms, generally speaking, particular firms about cash flows, this has always been a challenge. 
so I think this is, I mean, this is a very short version of to say of what, what you were referring to earlier. And the same holds for some of these cryptocurrencies. Also, when, you know, you have, a, you provide some form of utility and it's not really clear how much people are willing to pay for it, especially going forward in the long run. What I was trying to allude to, though, is though that there are real cash flows that, that exist in this world. And in fact, I would argue going forward, we will be able to, to evaluate specific projects quite well because, you know, there will be concrete amounts of money which will be flowing to them. So in some sense, actually, the crypto world will create a lot more clarity over financial assets and the value of banks, for instance, or financial services than ever before because of the level of, because of, the level of transparency that you have. And, and that leads uh, perfectly into this next question. There is this common conception that crypto is used primarily for legal activity. Uh, what is your take on this, Professor? That's a bit disingenuous to say. Um, there's no question that uh, especially Bitcoin has been used in many illegal transactions. You know, uh, obviously, you know, when people have, um, what is it, the, the hostage taking attacks of your computer, I, I forgot what's it called again. Um, but, you know, you might, people try to make you do Bitcoin payments um, because they are a little harder to trace. Um, we have seen this, um, the Silk Road used a lot of payments in Bitcoin early on. Um, but to that, I'm going to say, well, keep in mind that everything you see on the blockchain, in particular, like the, the, you know, the more advanced ones like Ethereum, you can actually trace it, right? So, for instance, um, one common complaint is, oh, you know, decentralized exchanges could lead to money laundering. And to that, I say, really? How? Because if you make a trade on a decentralized exchange, you, use, you connect your wallet to it, right? So this is, the, this is a piece of software that keeps your private keys. Um, you make a transfer, it goes from one token in your wallet to another token in your wallet. All of that is visible, right? So to tell me that, you know, this is a way how you can obfuscate what you're doing is, is simple nonsense. Now, you would also be able to see, you know, where money flows through the system. Now, there are some, some tools that people can use uh, to, to obfuscate that, but that's not straightforward to use. And the reality is, is that if you're a law enforcement officer, for instance, you have a lot more tools at your disposal. So if you can find the criminals and if you can identify the wallets, then you're actually done. You can do a lot more than you ever could before. Uh, so, so that brings me to a question which goes back to the regulatory question. There's a lot of talk about, oh, but you have to do AML and all that. To which I can say this is, look, AML is something that well, basically what we do in AML regulation is we took banks and financial institutions and the law enforcement world deputize them to do their work for them. Well, the blockchain world has no financial institutions that you can deputize. So you have to find other ways how to do your job, right? Very simply put. So maybe that's then you have to find out who the criminal are, who the criminals are and link them to their wallets. But then you're done, essentially. You can actually find them. You can see where their money is flowing and so on and so forth. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like to say that just because a particular institutional structure works really well for us to accomplish the goal of prosecuting criminals does not mean that when there's a new technology coming along that it has to play by the same rules of the old system. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I like to think that especially the decentralized finance world is used for a lot of um, legitimate purposes and pre predominantly for, uh, for legitimate purposes. And that, uh, you know, people actually, it gives it huge opportunities um, to be used for legitimate purposes. Um, so, I, so very briefly, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, hope I'm not going on for too long. But if you look at my, if you go back to my presentation, I have a, a one particular slide where I show countries which have very high level of inflation. And where people in these, country would, in these countries would have access to the blockchain network, they would have access to financial services, they would have access to a currency which is much better than their own because it's more stable. So that leads to huge possibilities of financial inclusion. So, and you know, people in these countries could use this to their advantage. So if anybody is going to tell me that people using a blockchain in Venezuela are committing a crime, uh, you know, because by, by trying to avoid the hyperinflation in their own country. I'm sorry, this is just a cruel statement per se. All right. Th thank you, Professor. Um, we, we have time for one last question. Where do cryptocurrencies come from? Are there significant differences between one cryptocurrency and another? Well, um, Again, uh, so the, the very early, the, the idea of decentralized cash has existed for a while. Uh, it has just not gotten, nobody got it to work before 
Bitcoin um, before Satoshi Nakamoto. And, um, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote his uh, paper or her paper, it could be a woman for all, of all we know, it could be a group of people, um, just at around the time of the financial crisis. Um, you know, cause and consequence is not 100% clear there, but clearly that was a time when people lost a lot of trust in the financial system. And, you know, having the idea of, hey, maybe we can actually do a world of banking and banks without financial institution, in particular at the time, was extremely appealing, right? Because banks basically engaged in behavior that, you know, was potentially very risky. And then we, we the perception was that we mutualized the losses that came along. So it means the, the, the general public had to take up these losses. Clearly, that did not sit well with people, and it should not sit well with people. So, you know, that kind of gives you a little bit of this of this origin of where it's coming from. There's also a lot of libertarianism on there, which is, a, you know, something that I'm not too too fond of, to be quite honest. Um, but you know, that basically gives you an idea of the of the origin. Now, one of the things that Bitcoin has going for is, of course, is brand recognition, right? So this is why it has high value and all that. Dogecoin, this is the the favorite cryptocurrency of this. Um, car salesman from California, uh, you know, is essentially is a joke because it's exactly a carbon copy of, of Bitcoin. And the, you know, the person who invented it, they basically said, hey, but look, mine is better because, you know, it's linked to a dog, right? My, my dog's picture and all that. I mean, it was meant as a joke, but uh, somehow it, it took off too in some form, thanks to, you know, some pumping and dumping from somebody else. Well, pumping at least. I'm not sure about the dumping. That's an, that's an allegation, right? But the, the really interesting development was Ethereum. And Ethereum started with the recognition that we can do a lot more with the idea of using you know, a common network using some form of computer algorithm and agreeing on execution of code. And that's really when things took off, when we found a way how we can essentially create an internet of value, right? As opposed to an infinite of information, which our normal internet is. Now, this is, again, a very wide-ranging discussion and very, very broad, what I just gave as an answer. Um, maybe I should say that in the Q&A that is going to be a bit more um, extensive that we're going to record separately from this, I'm going to talk more about some of these topics. We're also going to talk about non-fungible tokens, NFTs, um, market manipulations, and government reactions with their own cryptocurrencies or digital currencies. Sorry, I should say not crypto, but digital currencies. Back to you. All right, thank you very much, Professor. Um, everyone, this brings us to the end of our Q&A, but as a reminder, Professor Park will be recording a follow-up session to help answer the many other questions that have come in, and we'll be sending a link to the recording to all registrants via email. On behalf of the University of Toronto, thank you, Professor Park, for your presentation and your very thoughtful answers to our guests' questions. Thank you for having me. To our guests, Following this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a post-event survey. We do hope you will take a couple of minutes to complete it as your feedback is very helpful to us as we plan future events. And if you are interested in learning more about upcoming lectures, events, concerts, and more, I encourage you to check out UFD's virtual hub for alumni. The link is being posted in the chat right now. With that, I thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to welcoming you again at another UFD online event. Have a wonderful afternoon.